evening for this program. My name is Mike Frazier from the Rhinebeck Historical Society, and I'd like to introduce uh, this evening's speakers. Uh, we have Tom Rinaldi and Bob Rassensack, Yassensack, um, and both of them, I understand, um, wound up meeting at one point. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my notes here from my uh, conversation with them recently, um, but it was on April Fool's Day in, in 1999, um, and uh, they, the two of them have been working together for quite a while. Uh, we actually had them as a program back in 2006, and there may have been a very few of you who were present for that, but it seems high time that we hear from them again. Uh, they are the authors of Hudson Valley Ruins, uh, and rather than my take away anything from their thunder, what I'd like to do is to present Tom and Robert and hear from them directly. Thank you, Michael, and thanks everybody for coming to join us tonight. I'll just go into screen share mode. As uh, you heard, we have a book, Hudson Valley Ruins, Forgotten Landmarks of an American Landscape. And we've been lecturing for the last uh, 15 or so years on that topic, and we still do it. Uh, but a few years ago, Tom and I got the idea to do an offshoot program, Bricks and Brick Ruins of the Hudson Valley. So this one will be a little bit less biographical, and we're gonna jump right into the topic at hand. Uh, but first we acknowledge we are far from being the experts on this subject matter. There's a lot of people who uh, taken into the hobby of collecting bricks in recent years. And long before us, there are others who have authored a couple of great books on the subject of the Hudson River brick industry, uh, both of whom are from longstanding brick making families, Daniel Denoyles and George V. Hutton. So if you really want to know the full story of brick making in the Hudson River Valley, I highly recommend checking out these two books, but we'll try to give you the quick rundown of it tonight along with some of our favorite brick buildings of the Hudson River Valley and some of the ruins of the brickyards that you might be able to find today. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Tom, who's gonna to give us a short history of brick making in the Hudson River Valley. Okay, thanks, Rob. Thanks everyone for coming. Nice to see you all. Um, as Rob said, um, we are not the definitive experts in the history of the Hudson River brick industry. And tonight's talk is gonna be mostly uh, kind of uh, about the brickyards that we've photographed, what you can still see of them. Um, but before we get to that, um, we sort of you know, felt like we couldn't talk about that without uh, doing a little bit of background on the, on the industry. The brickyards were, as many of you surely know, um, one of the most important um, industries in the history of industry in the Hudson River, um, and one of the most histor important historical themes in the history of the Hudson Valley, I think generally, industrial or otherwise. Here is a photograph of a typical Hudson River brickyard, um, late 19th century. This, I believe, is the Schultz Brickyard, which is right across the river from Rhinebeck, um, with a good pair of binoculars from the uh, certain spots on the Rhinebeck waterfront. You could probably look across the river and still see that brick chimney that's there on the left. Um, and if any of you have taken the new stretch of the Empire State Trail that goes kind of uh, north of Kingston or in the area that's known as East Kingston, um, you may have seen this chimney sort of at the north end of that trail kind of uh, it's in an area that I think is not yet open to the public, but you can see it sort of near the, the gate at the north end of that uh, stretch of the, the uh, that new scenic Hudson walkway that's opened over there. Um, Rob has the clicking privileges, so I'll say next. Uh, here's another photograph of a typical Hudson River brickyard, and you can see kind of the, this is looking away from the water. Um, this is a, uh, I don't know exactly which brickyard this was, um, but you can see kind of the clay bank rising up in the background there. Next. Um, so there were, as I said, this was one of the, the most important industries in the region, and one of the most important kind of historical things in my estimate that happened in the Hudson River Valley was brickmaking from the uh, Dutch period in the 17th century 
um, all the way up until very, very recently, um, brick making was a feature of uh, the Hudson River waterfront between New York and Albany. And uh, at one point, um, I, I, the exact numbers are escaping me, but I think the industry peaked in 1906. It's something like 135 yards. Does that sound right, Rob? That sounds about right. Yeah. And here's a map kind of showing roughly some of the, the distribution of those yards um, as it would have been probably in the late 19th century when um, there were sort of two sort of clusters. One of them was in the kind of Rockland County, Westchester County area, uh, Peekskill, Croton, and Haverstraw especially. Um, and then there was the Upriver District, which was mostly the Ulster County waterfront, but uh, up into Columbia County too, and also Greene County. And you can sort of see how that lays out in this map. Next. It's another graphic again from the George Hutton book that Rob showed earlier. Um, this is showing the, the sort of upriver district. Um, what tended to happen was the uh, lower Hudson River brickyards, Haverstraw area, closer to New York City, uh, ran themselves out of clay before the upriver brickyards did. And proximity to New York certainly having something to do with that. Um, so uh, in the later decades of the history of the industry, the Ulster County waterfront was really sort of the, where these were mostly concentrated. And you can sort of see uh, this map, you can sort of see the, the horizontal-ish line sticking out of the Ulster County waterfront is the, um, the bridge, uh, the Kingston Rancliffe Bridge. And you can see how these yards were all clustered in that stretch below the bridge, especially. Next. So here's an aerial view of the cluster of brickyards that existed down uh, in Haverstraw. There's an interesting connection between the Haverstraw brickyards, which disappeared, as I said, longer ago than the Ulster County brickyards. There's a connection between those Haverstraw brickyards and the, the Ulster County brickyards, which we'll get to in a few slides. Next. Um, so to give you kind of like a little tour of what these places uh, were like, this is a typical, this is a Sanborn fire insurance type map of a typical Hudson River brickyard um, as I think this is a Schultz yard um, as it, it uh, the Schultz yard being in East Kingston, that yard that I was saying where you can still see the brick chimney at the north end of the Empire State Trail there. Um, this would have been a, a typical late 19th century uh, arrangement and that row of rectangles that you can see sort of running vertically uh, right next to the uh, to the, the dock there is uh, kilns, basically, I believe. Next. Uh, so to just kind of like walk you through, to walk us through the, the process, um, obviously started in the clay bank. The Hudson River uh, just serendipitously happened to have extensive clay banks um, right by the waterfront. So perfect connection for transportation uh, right down to the big market for bricks, which was all the river towns, of course, but especially New York City. Um, and this became more and more true after a series of fires in the early history of New York City resulted in laws requiring fireproof construction uh, and outlawing wood frame buildings in many parts of the city. Um, so the clay would be dug out of the clay banks and then next had to be formed into the shape of bricks. And to do this, the clay was packed into wood molds first by hand. Uh, as I said, this is the uh, uh, industry that began in the 17th century uh, in the Hudson River. So there was an evolution uh, from hand packing to then here's a, an example of uh, a horse powered brick machine as it would have looked in the 1890s um, from the George Hutton book probably would have already been obsolete. Uh, in fact, I can say certainly this was uh, quite an obsolete uh, means of uh, molding bricks by the 1890s because next slide. The big development in the industry on the Hudson River was this, the Vervalen brick machine, which was patented in 1852 by a Haverstraw brick maker. And this mechanized the process of packing the clay into those molds, which was enabled the brickyards to really ramp up their production after that. This was the same year as the Hudson River Railroad uh, opened up incidentally, uh, or one year after. Next slide. Um, here is what uh, that brick machine would have looked like in the context of the brickyard. And one of the great ironies that always kind of puzzled Rob and I in looking at what's left of the brickyards, one of the great ironies of this industry was here is the, the whole point of this industry is to make brick, which 
brick we associate with permanence and you know the most permanent of buildings are brick buildings very often um, but the brickyards themselves their structures were anything but permanent they were the most ephemeral kinds of buildings you could imagine really kind of lean to's uh, pole barns especially in the 19th century were the typical structures in the brickyard and so this uh, the very important brick machine uh, here is seen housed in basically a pole barn uh, with not even a permanent roof. Next slide. This, this is one reason why there's so little left of the brickyards today. Here's a typical scene at the Hutton Brickyard, which um, was uh, arguably the most important of the brickyards over across the river in Kingston. And as we'll see, one of the few places you can see anything left of the brickyards today. Uh, here's the drying yard with the brick out uh, being left out to dry, having already been molded, uh, but not yet fired in the kiln. So next, here's another view of a drying yard, probably at Haverstraw, uh, the bricks all being laid out uh, before being kiln fired. Next. This sort of speaks a little bit to the seasonal nature also of this industry. This was something that did not go on in the winter time. And another kind of curious thing about the brickyards, which maybe uh, some of you probably already know, is that the brickyards sort of doubled as ice, uh, ice harvesting operations too. So in the winter time, when you couldn't be molding and firing and leaving bricks out to dry, uh, the yards would many of them turn over into ice harvesting operations. Um, both of there's another business that's long gone from the Hudson River today. Um, but this is making a brick kiln. Uh, this type of kiln that I'm sure many of you know, there's various different types of kilns for firing bricks. Uh, the type of kiln that was preferred and was a definitive part of the Hudson River industry was called the Scove kiln. Uh, and here, uh, these workers are stacking up the molded bricks into a kiln. And basically, it's just a big stack, uh, very rectangular looking stack of uh, dried mold, molded brick with these little lancet arched openings that you see uh, two of them there. This is a, a kiln that's really sort of just started to be built. It will, by the time they're done with it, it'll occupy, it'll go to the left and to the right in this uh, image, uh, way past the frame that you see on the screen. Uh, they're just huge structures. Uh, those lancet ar arched openings is where the fire would be lit to, uh, to fire these brick. Next slide. The Scove kilns were kind of a highly fraught operation. Uh, they resulted in a lot of waste. They were incredibly, incredibly inefficient. Um, and part of that is that, you know, just by their nature, the brick that were closer to the fire would be overcooked. The bricks that were too far from the fire would be undercooked. Uh, and so there was just this sort of sweet spot of brick that were just kind of just right. And some of those overcooked brick uh, came to be called clinkers. And in the early 20th century, there was sort of a, a market for those in certain types of architecture, as we'll see a little bit later in the slideshow. But a lot of these bricks were just not usable at all. And so they were just dumped at the brickyard sites. The brickyards would use them for fill and especially would use them for riprap uh, along the shorelines of the brickyards to sort of stabilize where their docks were. Uh, and for this reason, you can very easily spot these brickyard sites. There's nothing left in, uh, in most cases uh, in the way of structures at these sites. But if you were to just say, do uh, get on like Google Earth and do a virtual flyover of the Hudson River shoreline, especially in places like Ulster County, you'll see these little red splotches uh, and uh, on the shoreline, uh, basically beaches of bricks. And those are the telltale signs of where these brickyards were. And those bricks that are dumped on the shoreline were the waste product of these scove kilns. They were also found to be incredibly uh, environmentally unfriendly because all of that uh, stuff, coal and later oil that was being burned to fire these kilns just uh, you know, went straight up into the atmosphere. So way before um, the sort of more environmentally, environmentally conscious era that we're living in now, um, the state of New York eventually outlawed Scove kilns on the Hudson River. Um, and that was the end of the Hutton Brickyard. Next slide, that was in 1979, I think. Rob and I came to find uh, other images, uh, artists' uh, kind of uh, perspectives on some of these Hudson River brickyards. Here's one by an artist called Ernest Fine, uh, called Brickyard on the Hudson. These tended to, it seems like artists kind of discovered these places in the 1930s. Uh, next slide. By which time uh, the brickyards were really kind of disappearing. And there was a sort of kind of like a romance to them, like many of them were already abandoned or 
you know, it, you could sort of tell that these artists way back then um, had kind of the same appreciation that Rob and I later came to have for these places as, uh, you know, see them now before they disappear. Um, here's a, a painting by uh, uh, Louise Bouche, if I'm saying that right, called uh, Brickyards at Glasgow, New York, which would have been up by Socrates. Next slide. This was uh, in literature a little bit too. We found references to the Brickyards. This is one of my favorite quotes that we found in researching our book, Hudson Valley Ruins. Uh, the Hudson is lined on both sides with the picturesque weathered ruins of many yards, their chimneys standing lonely beside tumbled, weed-grown walls and staring empty windows. This is from Carl Carmer's book, The Hudson, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, one of kind of the definitive histories of the region. So with that, that's the brief history of Hudson River Brickyards. Um, I'll pass this over to Rob, who will present uh, what we found in looking for these places, uh, starting in the, let's say, late 90s, early 2000s. So we'll go through a little tour of the surviving brickyard ruins that can be found today or could recently be found. And the most significant one is one that's probably familiar to many folks who've walked that part of the Empire State Trail that Tom mentioned that goes past uh, not only the Schiltz Brickyard, but the Hutton Company Brickworks in Kingston. And uh, we had the good fortune of meeting up with some folks, including I think uh, who's here tonight, our friend Fred Reek, who took me out in his rowboat uh, to get this photograph. So we're fortunate to have some folks who helped us out and do some research and get some pictures over the years. And the Hutton Yard is significant because it was the longest operating, uh, continuously operating brickyard along the Hudson River going back to 1865 when it was first known as the Courts and Hutton Company. Uh, but the Hutton family shortly took over and ran it for 100 years up until 1965. And the brickyard changed hands several times until closing around 1980, as Tom mentioned before. And this is about how it appeared in the middle of the 20th century with the clay banks behind it. And much of that clay bank has been turned into a parking lot now for the uh, events and weddings that are happening at the brickyard proper along the shore. Uh, most of those buildings in this aerial picture are still standing, although a few uh, we think have been demolished and some newer structures have been built as well. Uh, the site served as a restaurant, I believe in the 1980s and early 1990s. There were some newer uh, non-brickyard sheds that were built there as well. But the most significant structures to us are those steel kiln sheds in the lower right and the crane that is there along the river. And here's an aerial um, schematic of the existing structures probably taken in the 1960s or 1970s and uh, showing the road that goes through there, which is now the Brickyard Trail, but also a railroad spur uh, that went through the property up to the um, Hudson Cement Works a little bit further north, and as well as some tracks that went through the property uh, to carry uh, material from the clay banks to the Brickyard buildings. And this was about um, more or less how we found the Brickyard in the early 2000s, although I'm sure this image is probably from like 2013 or so. And you can see the kiln sheds there at the uh, center portion of the image there and the clay banks again are on the left and some of the other associated brickyard buildings are still standing as well at the lower portion of the image. And this site was um, certainly a place that attracted our interest as a ruin visually and photographically, but also significant at the last intact brickyard in the Hudson River Valley. Uh, there are a number of places you can go to and see remnants of brickyards or finding bricks, uh, but this was the only place that, where you could still see the majority of the intact uh, buildings still standing. Uh, the Hutton Yard closed again around 1980 due to environmental regulations. They could have upgraded and put in new equipment, but they chose not to. Uh, so the brickyard closed down and it sat empty. Uh, the kiln shed sat empty. Again, some newer structures were built. It went through another phase as a restaurant elsewhere on the property. Uh, but in the early 2000s, a developer had proposed plans to build a housing on the site and ourselves and some of our friends advocated for the preservation of the Hutton Company brickworks and those kiln sheds, which are um, somewhat perhaps of an anomaly. As Tom mentioned, a lot of the original brickyard structures in the Hudson River Valley were built out of wood. Uh, but this particular uh, advancement was actually built in 1928 at a brickyard in Haverstraw. And that brickyard closed about four years later and in 1940, the Hutton Yard acquired these kiln sheds, these steel kiln sheds, and disassembled them and floated them upriver and reassembled them at the Kingston site where they remained in operation, uh, again, through the end of the Hutton Company's existence 
So they're not necessarily original to the original time period of the Hudson River brick industry, but they're nevertheless an intact uh, significant structure uh, that does in our mind uh, deserve protection. Those are very typical of the, the brickyards sort of uh, say from the 1930s onward, the, the kind of like last flowering of the brickyards, these big still uh, steel sheds with big clear stories were sort of the signature structure. And it was around 2016 where the property was finally purchased. The previous developer was not uh, proceeding with their plan to build housing. Uh, maybe they didn't get approval, we're not sure, but uh, they sold it uh, to a real estate company who is, uh, first had started putting on some flea markets and food markets there and an uh, enterprise called Smorgasbord operated here in 2016 and 2017. Uh, their primary location was in Brooklyn and they set up a satellite event space here. Uh, again, not inside these kiln sheds, but in other structures around the property. And now in more recent years, uh, the Hutton Company or the Hutton Brickyards, as it's now called, had been reinvented as a space for weddings and events. I think they have a restaurant and a bar on the property. And about a, a year or two ago, they put up a number of cabins on the site as well, although these are uh, far and away uh, not quite like rustic cabins that we might be encountering, but a uh, very high end uh, destination camping, if you will. And uh, we're glad to see that a number of structures have been preserved and we have our fingers crossed that uh, those steel kiln sheds will be protected and put to some interesting and innovative use in the future, although that uh, still does remain to be seen. Tom showed that image of the Schultz Brickyard earlier, and this is that boiler flue that is still standing there. Again, uh, part of the new uh, Hudson Cliffs Park that is being developed by Scenic Hudson. And this little portion of the park is not open to the public yet, but you can catch a glimpse of it in the very north end of the trail in the East Kingston section. Here's that uh, image again for reference. A lot of old wood etchings and postcards show some of the remnants uh, or show some of the brickyards as they were in full tilt in the late 18 and early 1900s. And some of the surviving structures, as Tom mentioned, are not those brickyard structures that were largely built out of wood, uh, but actually accessory buildings like this mule barn uh, that is uh, on the property and still standing. And we're waiting its fate to see what will be done with the structure. We hope it can be put to use. Uh, but sometimes these mule barns or carriage barns and other structures are those that actually survive more so than the places where the brick was actually made. Or you can get on the water. And if you have a friend who has a boat like we do, you can get out and see the uh, brickyard structures from the river, which is another interesting way to see and appreciate them. A little house in the top uh, of the hill there is perhaps a brickyard manager's home. A um, number of uh, little small communities developed around these brickyards and the houses themselves are interesting remnants of those times and spaces. We'll see a few such uh, brickyard houses, if you will, later on in the show. This chimney is not part of the new park, but it's not a little bit further north of it, but it's behind someone's house. So the only way we could get to it was get out onto a boat and see it from the shoreline. But it's an interesting little chimney. Unlike the others that are square shaped, this is a round boiler flue, boiler flue chimney uh, that survives on private property north of the new park being developed there in Kingston. Actually, I should say, uh, correct myself, when the time when I first got into this, uh, the Hutton Brickyard was not the only surviving brickyard. It is now, uh, but about 15, 20 years ago, the Powell and Minnick Brickyard was intact. And we stumbled upon it, I think in 2004, and uh, had taken these photographs about three years after the Powell and Minnick Brickyard closed. It was the last operating brickyard in the Hudson River Valley and closed in around October of 2001. Uh, so we've missed our chance just by a few years to see a brickyard in operation but we were glad to get up there and take some photographs of it, uh, more or less as an intact brickyard. Tom, if you want to jump in at any point, feel free to do so. But you can see, see the similarity between these kilns at Pal kiln sheds at Palaminic and the kiln sheds that still exist that are just barely clinging on uh, at Hutton now. And some people who uh, maybe took the train down to New York from Rancliffe or Poughkeepsie, uh, probably any time before the early 1990s might have remembered just north of Beacon, um, the Brockway Yard had a huge set of these big steel, steel kiln sheds, which were sort of the latter day uh, inheritors to the, the uh, 
the sort of lean-to structures that were common in the 19th century. Uh, these were similar kinds of structures, but just a little bigger and with uh, metal roofs instead of planks. Um, but these, unfortunately, at Palo Minic disappeared after we photographed them. There are actually six of these structures still standing, and there were pallets of brick all around the property. And uh, we were able to get a number of photographs of them and the crane that was still standing that's also now gone there. And uh, you can see uh, a railroad bridge at uh, Castleton across the way there in the background. And again, another uh, building that still survives, fortunately, it was a, a coal shed, if I'm not mistaken, Tom, as it appeared on one of the insurance maps, right? Yeah, it may have been a mule barn before that. Mm -hmm. And um, what enabled the uh, Powell and Minute Company to survive a lot longer was they actually did upgrade their equipment. They invested in new machinery and they went away from the scope kiln that Tom had explained earlier and invested in a new tunnel kiln. And this is located in a separate building. There's uh, kiln sheds that we had just showed you probably hadn't been used in several decades, except perhaps for storage but the bricks were being made up until 2001 in a tunnel kiln building. And uh, the bricks would actually have been placed on kiln cars and passed through a very long masonry structure uh, that would accommodate both the, the firing and drying process and reducing the amount of times that the brick needed to be handled by workers in the factory and increase efficiency. And also um, had some improvements over air quality as well from the old scope kilns. So this is how Powell and Minnick was able to operate up until 2001. This is a photograph that we took from across the way at the uh, Skodak Hoteling uh, Island State Park. And the chimney in the background is not from the brickyard, but it's actually from one of the large uh, cement works there at Ravina. And I think that chimney is actually now gone. It's been replaced by a, a newer structure as well. So it's interesting to see how these industrial sites are adapting and upgrading over time. What happened at Palo Minic, uh, the property was bought by a company that operates a marine salvage terminal. And just a few years after we took these photographs, the uh, old steel kiln sheds were demolished. We have some of the last photographs of them. There's some interesting history here as well. Uh, there's a lot of history about uh, labor strife at the brickyards and uh, conditions there, of course, you know, were not always the safest and people wanted better working conditions and better pay. And it wasn't really until the 1930s that a labor organization came to the Hudson River brickyards and better pay uh, was offset by fewer workers there on the brickyard sites. Uh, but there was an incident in the early 1900s there when the owners of the brickyard who at the time were actually Sutton and Sutterly who operated the site before Pal and Minnick bought it later in the 20th century um, had brought in workers from the South to uh, uh, take over the work of striking local laborers. And the uh, local laborers actually raided the brickyards with arms and chased uh, Mr. Sutterly onto a boat who had to escape uh, by the Hudson River to avoid being shot. I think she was fired upon. And this is the area where those striking laborers had set up camp over the brickyard there. So a lot of history at the brickyards and labor history as well. A lot of stories that can be told, not just how the brick was made, but also the people who worked there and the conditions. So these structures are all gone there. And what is going on now is that uh, the Marine Salvage Terminal is a place where large uh, components of power plants and bridges are being assembled and put together here and loaded onto barges and sent down river to their ultimate destinations. And this is the original site of the Powell and Minnick Brickyard. Again, Sutton and Sutterly operated that site in Queemans, downtown Queemans. Uh, originally, but Palo Minic was located a little bit further north of the village of Queemans. And we were walking out at Skodak Hoteling Island. We saw this little structure across the way that was very similar to a uh, powerhouse for an ice harvesting facility in Columbia County, which we'd understood was to be the only surviving such powerhouse. And what would happen in the background of this image, there was a large ice house originally, as Tom had mentioned, these brickyards. Um, often were originally set as uh, ice harvesting facilities or maybe served sort of dual functions. And this little uh, facility set um, had uh, power generators for sending ice blocks up on conveyors into the large ice houses behind them. And this is how it would have appeared uh, when the structures were intact. There are no more ice houses along the Hudson River Valley today. 
uh, but there are now at least two of these little powerhouse facilities that we're aware of. And an up close view of the building as we saw it around maybe 2006 or seven or so, I think we went there to take these photographs. This one is not on public property. We were able to get permission from the property owner to go down their driveway and into the woods to photograph this building. But across the way in Columbia County, I believe this is publicly accessible, the remnants of the Cary Brickyard, which is another one of the companies that was able to operate up until the 1950s. There were about a half dozen or so uh, brickyards that managed to operate uh, post-World War II. And that chimney is in this uh, image today. This was an extensive facility that actually stretched across both sides of present day uh, Route 9 that goes through the hamlet of Newton Hook. Tom, if you want to jump in, feel free to. It's 9J. 9J, thank you for clarifying that. It's a kind of neat comparison of uh, wintry scenes of the brickyard and its operating days versus how we found it. And this and is it's a also, oh, Go ahead. Uh, one thing I think we both found in looking at these places is how remarkably overgrown most of them are today. And so to photograph things like this remnant of a scove kiln, we believe, uh, the, the wintertime is really often the only time you could get anywhere near them. I mean, the, uh, very heavily overgrown and probably the most tick prone uh, of the places that we visited through the years. I've read that ticks are dormant below freezing temperature. So now is definitely a good time to go and visit these overgrown brickyards. You don't want to do this in the summertime. So here are some remnants of uh, conveyor systems that ran along, uh, or actually I should say across 9J, probably like a little bit of a railroad track that went over the road there, carrying material into the brickyard proper. So you can actually wander around uh, deep into the woods and still see remnants of the brickyards, not just the kiln sheds or the kilns, uh, but also uh, support structures as well. Another place that really captured our fascination as a somewhat intact brickyard is the Staples Brickyard in Malden, which is part of a public park, but one that's not heavily advertised or promoted, it's not improved, but uh, it is indeed public property. And you can wander your way through the heavy overgrowth there and see remnants of the Staples Brickyard. Uh, but here's an image of it that appeared in the Hutton book. And on the left is the structure that still stands today, which is the brick machine building and the wooden uh, sheds to the right are long gone. The wooden material is probably salvaged as, uh, as firewood or fuel material uh, after the brickyards closed down. And you can see the original drying sheds along the shoreline there to the right. Tom, if you wanna jump in. Yeah, the, the same structure that you could see kind of on the left in the previous photo there. And what you can see the remnant of the gable roof is the corresponds to the big gable roof that ran perpendicular to the river shoreline in the previous slide. Uh, you know, almost nothing left of this brickyard today, but this structure at last check was, was incredibly still there. This is, I think, fair to say one of the more significant standing remnants of any of the Hudson River brickyards that you can see today and is on public land. And to the right of this image is a boiler structure that Tom took a fabulous photograph of, one of my favorite photographs that Tom has taken. He's taken a lot of great pictures, but I like this picture in the summertime. We went against our best advice. You might've even gone up there on your own uh, to get the picture of this boiler uh, surrounded by heavy overgrowth uh, so many years ago, but as of about a year and a half ago, it is still standing, but the chimney to the left of it is gone. It seems around the, the mid late 2000s, the DEC did a sweep of some of these riverfront properties to clean up contaminated materials. And uh, some old chimneys came down along with some oil tanks and hust, uh, rusted out hulks of old vehicles and other kind of uh, potentially polluting structures were removed from these sites. Uh, but this boiler is still there. But uh, one thing that we thought was very interesting and significant was this gantry crane here located along the shore again, next to the drying kilns. This is how the bricks would have been loaded onto uh, barges that would have carried the material down river to wherever the bricks were being used. Uh, likely uh, some of the early skyscrapers in New York City were being built from materials from these brickyards. Uh, so we got a photograph of that gantry crane around 2004, probably about two or three years before it was removed from the site, unfortunately. Uh, 
There also were a lot of uh, accessory structures around the property as well, uh, including several wooden buildings, which probably were homes for brickyard managers or brickyard workers. I think they're all gone now, or if they're still standing, they look more or less like this. Uh, but uh, we were able to see some of these structures and get some photographs of them before they were gone. Uh, the very ephemeral buildings associated with the people who actually worked at the brickyards. And then there's lots of foundation structures, uh, remnants of other buildings and remnants of uh, some of those railroad tracks that ran through the site. You might see at a place like the Staples Brickyard, may have been the base of one of the kilns here. And as Tom mentioned earlier, the best thing you're gonna see at any of these brickyards really is the uh, thousands and thousands, if not millions of uh, rejected bricks that litter the shoreline there. And many of these are those clinkers or lammies from the uh, areas of the kiln that were fired most. And as, as such, the bricks were deformed and not fit for use and just discarded as waste on the shore or used as reinforced bulkheads and um, can be found. And this is a great way to start a brick collection there by going and turning over bricks and hoping to find an intact brick. Although you're welcome to take the half ones as well, but folks who like to collect wanna find the ones that are mostly intact. The Washburn Yard is another lesser known place in Glasgow, just outside of Saugerties. And another structure there, again, probably not used for making bricks, uh, but again, may perhaps have been um, a building for carriages or for the horses that we saw in the earlier images for um, carrying the clay and before the railroad cars were put in and your horses would have been used for carrying materials around the site. But this is uh, an intact and interesting building that still stands at the Washburn Yard, uh, again, just south of Saugerties. Completely lost in the woods. and, and uh... I think we still have some stones to turn in trying to figure out exactly how this building was used. It seems like it was multiple uses, but there's some features of this building that I don't know if we'll see in, in any of the photographs that are totally unique uh, in you know the sort of world of any kind of comparable industrial buildings of that period. So it's sort of a mysterious structure. I'm not sure if we included those image in this talk, but further up the hill is this building, which appeared to be a duplex uh, apartment building, for, again, perhaps for managers of the brickyard who had a, a view looking down over the works, uh, but very hard to get to today, very, very heavily overgrown. And again, uh, only in the, the deepest part of winter is it possible to get to some of these structures. This is a pathway uh, down from the top of the hill, perhaps I think originally uh, was a space that had a uh, a railroad line for carrying material. I think we saw in one of the uh, black and white pictures, there was such a uh, conveyor system with the railroad track on top of it for carrying material. And the bricks themselves would have been used for reinforcing the roadbeds to the properties too. Staples has a, a carriage road that runs through it that is seems to have been completely paved in brick and you see little bits and pieces of it. Yeah, again, one of the best places for exploring a brickyard, even though there's only one remnant of a standing building there today, but a fascinating place with little bits of history scattered throughout the property. Another place is virtually impossible to get to. In fact, I don't think I've been back to it since I took this photograph in 2004 with the Empire Brickyard in Stockport, which was for a long time privately owned, but is now uh, several hundred acres been acquired as uh, preserved space along the Hudson River there in Stockport, just north of Hudson. And these are remnants of the Scove kilns. And I hope these structures are still standing. Fred Reek and I tried to get there a couple of years ago, but the road was heavily washed out and collapsed and we didn't quite make it far. And I think our thought was to approach it by water and we haven't gotten back to doing that yet. But uh, hopefully I, those Scove kilns will still be there. And there's an interesting quote in the George Hutton book about how um, you know, the tunnel kilns having replaced the scove kilns, you were no longer able to look through the scove kiln arches into hell's fire. So the very dramatic uh, view that George Hutton described that he kind of uh, wistfully lamented had been replaced by the tunnel kilns there. Uh, very interesting to see a longtime brickyard maker describe these things with some admiration and affectation, but uh, again, just uh, a, a place to kind of go and see 
significant but small remnant and uh, one of a few of these structures still standing along the Hudson River Brickyard today. Perhaps the best place to find bricks, but not a place to find brick buildings is the uh, place known as Duchess Junction, which is not much of a community today. There's a few residential houses, but in the early 20th century, it was thriving with brickyards and a railroad station and a number of different brickyards operated along the shore there, including the Hammond Company, uh, Bud was another one and several others. And the superintendent's house was actually one building that was still standing there in the early 2000s. I think Tom took this fantastic photograph and was significant because it was built with the Lammy brick, the discarded clinkers that were along the shore. Uh, but actually clinkers had a bit of a revival in the 1920s and 30s, uh, particularly in uh, some Tudor revival buildings and even the brickyards themselves repurposed them, in this case, for a superintendent's house. Uh, but this building is no more. Uh, a group of us set out to find it several years ago and walked around in circles until we finally just admitted that this building uh, was torn down some time ago. But uh, on Spring Street in Beacon, it's a very similar looking building built with these Lammy or discarded bricks. So it's interesting to see it. Um, there was an architect by the name of Grosvenor Atterbury who popularized a lot of this work in um, Queens, um, in the area of the Forest Hills uh, neighborhood. There are some buildings that he designed that used these Lammy bricks as well as some private estates. And it kind of took off for a little bit in the 1920s and 30s. And there even was a uh, place in Germany that uh, actually activated a brickyard purposely for uh, production of clinker bricks at the time because it was so popular. Uh, so though, if you do go down to the uh, Duchess Junction area, which is a part of the Hudson Highland State Park, you won't find any building. But there, I think, Tom, we walked out with maybe one day 12 or 14 different bricks, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that. Yeah. One place that we missed out on uh, was perhaps um, one of the largest brickyards along the Hudson River Valley, the Brockway Brickyard in Beacon, just north of the uh, Newburgh Beacon Bridge. And there is a great YouTube video, it's about five minutes long. Uh, not quite sure who MJ Conrad 5 is, but they filmed it and uploaded about five minutes of footage of the kiln sheds there. And they were probably were torn down in the mid to late 1990s, certainly before I was taking the train up the Hudson River. I don't remember seeing it. I don't know if you recall seeing it, Tom, either. I think I saw it and I, I uh, really scold myself for not being able to remember it because I, I know I must have seen it. Uh, but thankfully, other folks were out there taking videos and taking photographs and uploading them to the internet. Uh, this is the best documentation we've seen at the Brockway Yard. Uh, today, there is one little structure that's still standing there. Uh, again, remnant of a rail line that probably would have carried uh, clay material from the clay banks into the brickyard. And uh, there are now condominiums there on the east shore or eastern side of the uh, Metro North Railroad line there. And the brickyard itself it remains undeveloped. I'm not sure if it's even an official park, but you can kind of wade your way over the, the tracks there if you're so venturesome. I think a lot of people do it mainly for fishing, but uh, we did that one day and took this view looking back at the remnant of the last standing remnant of the Brockway Brickyard. Dennings Point was a place that I think Tom got to first in the early 2000s and found actually a number of buildings were still standing there. Uh, the site has been repurposed, but Tom, do you want to tell us a little bit about your images here? There were two buildings there. There's one now. Actually, there's a, a third building that's sort of known as the Paperclip Factory, but um, this is another building. I don't know, Rob, did we ever manage to figure out exactly what this building was used I for? I think we found it was a blacksmith shop, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Yes. It's yes, those of you watching this who are familiar with the Sanborn fire insurance maps, uh, Rob and I eventually discovered those in our research and spent an incredible day at the New York Public Library before any of them were available digitally, uh, looking at them on grainy microfilm, and many, many mysteries were, were solved that day. This was an interior view of it, which uh, unfortunately can no longer be had because this building has been demolished, even though uh, some of the other structures on the site have been preserved. This one was not marked for preservation, unfortunately. But this is the building that is now uh, the Beacon uh, Center uh, for a study of, I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering the name, uh, 
here, Tom, the Center for Rivers and Estuaries. Either. <laughs> time, time to go back down and visit it. Yeah. I don't know if there's uh, people are typing things into the chat. Anybody who happens to know what this is, please chime in. But uh, the Beacon Institute, and I believe they're located, uh, associated with Cornell, if I'm not mistaken. Time for a trip back. So we'll head on into a quick segment here just to go through some of our favorite brick buildings at the Hudson River Valley. I realize we're getting late into the evening, so we'll try to do a little bit of a whirlwind here. And um, Tom's going to explain that a lot of these bricks that uh, we see made at the Hudson River Brickyard were actually not used on the face of some of the buildings, but were been considered more common buildings for structural uh, purposes. This is a, a detail of the Park Avenue Armory in New York City uh, of a kind of half deconstructed wall and some restoration work that was going on there. And you see the, the brick sort of on the right of this picture is what we call face brick very often. And if you can really sort of squint to see it, you'll see that the edges of those bricks are, are very fine and come to a, a perfect kind of point. And the mortar joints are very, very tight. Well, the brick that was made at most of these Hudson River brickyards we're looking at was not that nice, expensive face brick. It was what we often call in New York backup brick um, or common brick. Um, and so for many uh, sort of more civic kinds of buildings would use Hudson River brick, but you wouldn't so much see it. You'd maybe see it on an interior wall in a basement, but you wouldn't typically see it used for a facade. But uh, Rob and I often in our travels around the Hudson River Valley spot buildings that maybe anywhere else in the world would have been built with a nicer grade of brick or would have been built not with brick at all, but built out of wood. But they're using this Hudson River brick. Uh, hey, go to the next slide. Well, here's your schematic showing your there's fantastic a, there's a little... drawing explaining it. Yeah, yeah. The, the photo on the right also kind of gives you an idea for this, this uh, the Hudson River brick being used behind the skin of face brick. Go to the next. The Bannerman's Island Arsenal is a, a place that used uh, brick structurally and somewhat decoratively, although it wasn't that fancy face brick that Tom was explaining. We'll see some of uh, those other um, vernacular structures in a minute, but I chose this one because it was literally built with uh, the clay of the Hudson River at Dutchess Junction, which was located just a short distance north. And you can see the imprint of the Hammond Company, uh, Bud and Aldridge were a few of the others, uh, but you can see how the brick was put to great effect as ornamentation, as well as, as a structural element here as the, uh, the stucco cement covering has been rotting away on the, the face of some of the buildings there. Uh, but Frank Bannerman, very creative in utilizing brick uh, in corbeling and in facing of the building here as a decorative element. But brick has been used in the Hudson River Valley uh, for uh, many centuries. In fact, I think one of the first efforts that's been documented is making brick in the Hudson River Valley goes back to about the 1628 or so. And uh, when it was used, uh, in this case around 1720 for the house of Janet and Tanneke Van Hosen, um, it would have been uh, to denote uh, the home of someone who was very wealthy and uh, at the top of society at the time and not as a common uh, structure. And they used some of the uh, clinker brick to denote their name on the edge of the building there. And well, I should say that the, the size of the building and perhaps it denotes more than anything that they were uh, wealthier compared to some of the other people in the area. And the brick has been used to good effect uh, along the uh, edge of the building as well. This building is a ruin and it's located in the middle of a trailer park just outside of Hudson, New York, the Dutch Village Mobile Home Park. You can drive up and see it. Right off State Route 66. Another place that utilizes uh, brick to great effect for ornamentation is Wincliffe, the home of Elizabeth Skirmer Horn Jones and Ryan Beck. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we got permission to go up there and photograph the site up close and get some really good detailed images here. And although brick is a pretty static material, it's a small, simple block, uh, the way it can be set uh, can be utilized for making arches or the edges of brick uh, being set to make triangular forms here. It's just really fascinating the different ways that skilled brick makers uh, can make a very interesting and appealing looking building uh, from these simple little blocks. <laughs> And what would the Hudson River Valley be without a place called Brick Row? 
and Brick Row was actually not built for a brickyard, but for the Athens terminal of the Saratoga and Hudson River Railroad. About 30 of these row houses were built uh, in the 1860s for uh, employees of the railroad line, uh, which only operated for just a few short years. And now these are private homes there uh, located just a bit north of the village of Athens. Fascinating little place to go and check out. And these are some of the homes that Tom was talking about earlier, built out of common Hudson River brick. Do you want to elaborate, Tom? You know, the kinds of buildings like that little bungalow on the on the right. Um, I don't know if you'd call it a, a ranch house on the lower left. It's one of my favorite houses to drive by with that big brick arch uh, that anywhere else in the world would have been maybe just a wood frame house with built, say, you know, when they were built, uh, clabbered siding or, you know, maybe even like asbestos siding. But in places like Socrates, um, where there was all of this brick being made locally, um, they were able to probably, they had some connection to the brickyard, I imagine. Maybe they were people who worked at the brickyards or had relatives who did uh, and were able to source this local material for building their houses. And, and so you kind of, uh, you can drive by these and, and sort of pick them out uh, around buildings that, you know, anywhere else might've been built as something different. Here's another good example. East Kingston, again, near the brickyards that we showed earlier, a number of these houses uh, made out of material from the Schultz and the Terry brickyards. Uh, this one was originally a school building, we believe. Uh, now it looks like it's an apartment building. Good example of adaptive reuse. Glad they preserved the building. And a lot of the great churches of the Hudson River Valley are built with brick and the village of Roseton doesn't really exist anymore except for this church there as the brickyards have been obliterated. Uh, by oil tanks and uh, power plants there. And there are uh, really none of, none of those homes of those workers still survive, but the church is still there, uh, just in short view of the Roseton power plant. Another great example of brick uh, corbeling and brick design here on the face of the church, which is still open. And there is the Dutch Garden in New City, which was a works progress administration project uh, designed by uh, Mary Mowbray Clark in 1939. She supervised it. She was a landscape architect and uh, she hired a skilled laborer from uh, one of the brickyards perhaps to come up. There are about five or 10 people who built uh, this tea house here and some uh, brick walls around the garden. And they used about, um, I think it's 50 different brick yards, bricks in the construction of the uh, garden here in New City, which is located next to the courthouse there. Again, um, the Haverstraw area uh, with one of the largest uh, concentrations of brickyard makers and uh, located not too far away from New City and a number of different brickyard manufacturers operated those yards over the years and about 50 or so different brands were utilized in making uh, this fascinating little structure here that pays tribute uh, to not only the brickyards and the brick makers, but also some of the early Dutch inhabitants of the area as well. Highly recommend checking out this place. So what's the brick legacy of the Hudson River besides a few abandoned brickyards here and uh, scores of littered brick along the shore? Uh, the best place to go and find out information is the International Brick Collectors Association. You can actually be a verified member. You get a, a number there. And you can swap bricks with people who collect not only all around the country, but all around the world. I highly recommend checking out their brick site, their website. And there is the Haverstraw Brick Museum as well, which is uh, the museum dedicated to the brickyards and the brick makers of the Hudson River Valley. Uh, I think they had a recent uh, renovation and reopening, so it's definitely worth checking out again if you have been there before. They also have some programs. They had one last week on uh, modern day brick making. And then there's the brickcollecting.com website by our friend Don Bailey, which is uh, the best resource for Hudson River brick making and lots of photographs of the brickyards. And if the brickyards aren't around anymore, he has those Sanborn map showing what was there and uh, where you could go to find out about them today. Alan Gilbert is one of the early brick collectors there who uh, had worked at Fordham and he had uh, studied, uh, taught about archaeology and studied uh, building materials and uh, went into collecting bricks and just learned about 
uh, the different ways brick was utilized in construction throughout the Hudson River history of going back to the early Dutch periods. Tom, this is one of our favorite pieces of art, right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, have we mentioned the term frog mark yet, Rob? Do I don't think so. I don't think we have. Maybe this is a good time goodness. to go into it. The, the As some of you may know, the many of these brick, particularly Hudson River, the brick molded in those wood brick molds uh, would have the mark of the brickyard that made them uh, spelled out or sometimes abbreviated uh, in a little recessed area on one of the broad uh, faces of the brick. Uh, those marks are known as frog marks and they serve multiple purposes. One obviously for advertising. Um, I think that the brickyards were being clever and found a way that they could use a little less clay um, and lighten their loads for shipment. But uh, most of all, they served to for mortar. Uh, when the bricks were being built into a wall, the mortar could key into these little depressions where the lettering was and help the wall stay together a little bit better. Um, but uh, when brick came to no longer be made in that way, uh, brick that is typically you see used in new construction in this country anyway, um, you seldom see these frog marks anymore. But where you see old bricks, anytime a building is torn down, uh, people like Rob and I and some of the more brick-minded people that we know uh, have uh, are always keeping an eye out for frog marks. And it's fun to walk down the street and see some used in a planter or in this case, uh, in a work of art. And uh, very often we are able to say, I know where that brick came from. And maybe it's a brickyard we've been to and photographed and it's kind of a, makes it an interesting hobby. Here's one I found on a wall at the stair at Lehigh building upside down a few years ago. And then there is our friend, uh, Stephanie Lewison, who is featured in the Wall Street Journal. She's got one of the great collections of bricks. And it's interesting that the Wall Street Journal would feature brick collecting because there's actually no financial value in bricks. Brick collectors will not sell bricks. If you join the IBCA, you can swap bricks with other people, but uh, somebody tries to sell you a Hutton brick for $45, don't take that deal. You can collect bricks on your own or uh, trade with other people. But you they're... can see them listed on eBay. Yeah. And sometimes people will sell a brick if it's got a, you know, a Yankee Stadium brick, for example. But that's a, that's a different kind of brick collecting. Mm -hmm. And here's our friends Andy Vanderpool and Fred Reek in Andy's garage with his display. Uh, it's interesting to see how the different brick collectors uh, display their bricks. And some of them have great spaces for them. Some of us, like Tom and I, don't really have them and they're in our basements or in the trunk of our car. But uh, if you've got space to display your bricks, it's a great conversation piece and a great way to see all those different frog marks and talk about history when fellow like-minded collectors get together. And here's this very small sampling of Andy's list uh, showing the frog mark, the brand, the name of the brick company, the grade he would give to the brick to the condition and where uh, the brick was made. Sometimes you might even want to add where the brick was found because uh, a lot of cases Tom and I collect our bricks from demolished buildings located far away from where they were actually produced. Here's a good up close view of Andy's collection. And there's a lot of variation in the frog mark and that's kind of what makes it uh, an additional uh, fun aspect of the hunt is find not only a different mark, but the variations on the different marks. And brick making got so popular or brick collecting got so popular that Arts Westchester uh, did an exhibit several years ago in association with the anniversary of the Erie Canal being constructed in association with the building boom of, the, of New York State and association with brick. And they had a great uh, exhibition about brick and brought in some brick collectors and brick historians. And some of us went down to Dutchess Junction there to find some bricks for that exhibit. A uh, great way to, to meet some friends and make some connections. And here is a, an image of that fantastic exhibit that was uh, set up in White Plains in 2018 and 2019. We're glad to be a part of that. Uh, not only uh, modern collectors and artists, but also a history of how brick was made and some displays of brick tools and also uh, stories about the different groups of people who worked at the brickyards. There are a lot of uh, immigrant communities or migrants who moved up here from other states. 
Um, a lot of fascinating information about uh, the social history of the Hudson River Valley can be told through the brickyards as well. And here are some of the uh, brick molds. Uh, very few of these still survive. Sometimes they do pop up at garage sales or at antique stores. Uh, a good friend of mine collected one for me this summer. I'm very fortunate to be the proud owner of one now. But before we had that, um, the New York State Museum built a little display for our bricks. And we had an exhibit there in 2016 and 17, uh, display of 40 Hudson River bricks in conjunction with our photographs of abandoned buildings throughout the Hudson River Valley. Unfortunately, we couldn't find a home for this, this, this mount. Nobody would take it and I didn't have room for it. So I think it ended up in a waste heap, very ironic, but I did get my brick back at least. Uh, Julia Whitney Barnes is one of the eminent brick artists at the Hudson River Valley and has done this Hudson River of bricks, I think maybe five or six times now. I think if she's here in the chat, she can chime in. Uh, but this is a photograph that Tom took at Wilderstein several years ago where there was a great display of her brick collection. Tom, if you want to jump in at any point. There is a 28 minute documentary about the Hudson River brickmakers on YouTube. So if you've had uh, not had your fill of us talking for an hour tonight, you can go on YouTube tonight or some other night and watch this uh, fascinating video. Or you can go to the Hutton Brickyard and spend a night there and learn about brick making in place. We can even have your wedding there if you want and they can gussy it up with some, some bricks as part of the decoration. And our friend Fred, we're gonna sort of end the brick, Hudson River brick portion of the talk on this note here at Arts Westchester with the quote they put on the wall from Fred, uh, every brick we find has a story behind it. Indiana Jones has nothing on us. So uh, that's kind of what brick collecting it feels like, the thrill of chasing down some things that are long forgotten and long discarded, uh, but definitely of interest to a lot of folks today and have a lot of stories to tell uh, you can just pick up a brick and tell so many different stories just by seeing the name of the brick maker on there and learning about where it came from, who might have made it, where it might have gone to, and what it might have been put to use for. I know we've been going for about an hour. If we do have a couple more minutes, there are some other images Tom has taken in Bangladesh of some brick making in the present day. So if you can bear with us a few more for minutes, it. we've got a bonus feature here. So I can go through. Do we want to try the, do, we wanna, do we want to try the film? Sure. Let's Our try it. it. We'll see uh, how it works. If it, if it streams steadily, if it's too jumpy, we'll, I've got some still pictures we can look at real quickly. Let me it's just minute film. go to the video for a second and share again. Just hang on just a second. While you're doing that, I'll give the backstory. So, I mean, uh, Rob and I had, you know, have this particular fascination with the Hudson River brick industry as something that essentially was gone before we were born or we overlapped with it when we were too young to really be able to have uh, seen it and experienced it. And, you know, so we know it mostly through black and white photos and piles of discarded brick on the Hudson River shoreline. I was in Bangladesh about now seven years ago already for looking at old boats and was in this remote area being carted around on the back of a cart. My video seems to have disappeared. I'll keep looking for it, Tom, keep going. Okay, yeah, if we can't find it, we've got the still pictures. And uh, the cart rounded a bend and there was basically before my eyes, a 19th century Hudson River brickyard in uh, going full tilt. And it was really this incredible experience. I'd seen them from a distance uh, in the kind of the, the Ganges Brahmaputra River Delta, but didn't think I would have the chance to get up close and personal with one. Uh, so it was really kind of like suddenly walking into one of these black and white photographs, not just a, you know from 50 or 60 years ago, but really like walking into a, a 19th century photograph. Uh, there, it turns out, are an incredible number of active brickyards not just in Bangladesh, but in Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, especially um, where the kinds of environmental regulations that put the Hutton Brickyard out of business in 1979, 1980, uh, still have not gone into effect uh, in those parts of the world. And so there are these functioning brickyards, the labor conditions sometimes get these places in the news. Um, so some of you may have uh, encountered some of them that way. I think uh, the uh, vice uh, 
news organization did a, a report on some of the brickyards in Pakistan. They're all very similar to each other uh, in appearance. Has it, oh, oh. Um, here we go, here we go. So I'll sort of do some voiceover uh, and sort of like that tour we did of the brickyards at the beginning um, of the presentation, uh, these video clips are kind of walking through the, the production from start to finish. So that was just a clay pit. Uh, some of the innovations like the brick mold machine that was patented here in the Hudson River in 1852 still are not in use in places like Bangladesh. So they're still actually molding the brick into wood molds uh, that still use frog marks. Uh, they're doing it by hand. Uh, and, you know, this is uh, a little jumpy with just the, the relay that we've got, but uh, I've never seen anyone work so fast in my entire life. Um, these are being molded and then just left right out to dry in the drying yards that are, you know, exactly like what you saw in those uh, 19th century photographs uh, on the Hudson River. This is actually a boat that has delivered uh, coal for the firing of the kilns, and they still use scove kilns. Here is uh, a scove kiln. These are fired, unlike the Hudson River kilns that had the fires with those little arches, uh, along the sides. These are sort of fired like this from the top uh, with coal dust shoveled in. And uh, interesting to note that the, uh, this worker doesn't have shoes on. And then when the uh, product is finished, uh, this is sort of incredible. If you can see what this guy is stacking up on his head here. Uh, this is actually just uh, in the Hooghly River below uh, Calcutta. Uh, each one of these smokestacks is venting a, a series of scone kilns for a brickyard. And it's one after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next. Um, and, you know, thinking of this in terms of things like climate change, it's kind of appalling. But um, in any case, uh, that was a little uh, window into a lost world um, that is, in a way, uh, those scenes are playing out as we are gathered here tonight. And that's it. Wow. Wow. Thomas and Robert, uh, what a fascinating presentation. And, uh, you know, you've touched on so many aspects of the brick industry here in the Hudson Valley and in Bangladesh. Um, what I'd like to do at, uh, you know, this point is to allow those who have questions to, I know I've got some in the chat here, and uh, what I'll do is share some of those questions. Uh, one of the questions is, what is being done with regard to historic preservation uh, designation as historic landmark for any of these sites that you've identified? Not much is the short answer. Yeah, some of these structures are on public land, uh, preserved land such as um, Dennings Point. And then of course the Hutton Yard is privately owned and they're making use of some of these buildings. So uh, there is interest, but these are buildings that are not necessarily designated as National Register Historic Sites or a National Historic Landmark. So there's no official protection, but um, we're hopeful that being that some of these remnants are on public land that they're somewhat protected from redevelopment at least, but they're not protected from the elements in time or you know people who are you know, going around creating mischief or anything like that. I don't know of any single Hudson River Brickyard structure that is a designated local landmark in its respective community. There may be one or maybe more than one, but I think the probably there are zero. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, even the buildings that were permanent enough to have survived the brick structures, mule barns and things like that um, are considered so rudimentary that they're often really overlooked. Um, which is one of the things that Rob and I, you know, that fascinated us about them. Um, the mule barn that's over at the Schultz site is a, a building that, despite having been ravaged by vandals and abandoned for quite a long time, it's actually still in fairly decent condition. And uh, But I think the jury's kind of out with Scenic Hudson right now as to uh, whether they will keep that building and if they do keep it, how it will be used. Um, but where these buildings now find themselves 
on state land, at least. Um, I don't think any are on the National Register of Historic Places, but certainly a building like that would be deemed, I hope, National Register eligible. And if it's on state land and in any kind of preservable, serviceable condition, that should protect it. But um, now it might be time to nominate some of these buildings for the National Register. I noticed that one of the publications that you uh, cited early in your presentation this evening was from the was a publication of the Society for Industrial Archaeology. Uh, does that organization take any role in trying to preserve, uh, trying to work with the state of New York and their local communities to designate any of these sites? They did advocate on behalf of the uh, kiln sheds at the Hutton Brickyard in the the early 2010s when the site was again threatened with demolition by a developer who wanted to put housing there. Um, so again, as that was at that time, the last uh, intact remaining brickyard, uh, they did express support uh, for the preservation of the building in terms of uh, you know, advocating to the city of Kingston that this building should be, or these structures should be protected. So that was their involvement. Lots of comments, uh, beautiful photos. Thanks so much. Loved your presentation. Uh, great to uh, great to hear about all the work being presented here. Uh, somebody mentions uh, Dorothy Oxner. We made adobe bricks at the Presidio in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, let's see here. One of the questions uh, in the drying yard, were the bricks stacked or did they need to dry in a single layer? There are people on this uh, meeting tonight, on this Zoom, who are probably better qualified than Robert I to answer that. I have an understanding, but I'm not sure if I'm right, which is that they, need, they were laid individually, and then when they dried to a point, they could be stacked. Yes. There were racks, I believe, for doing that. Someone said, Thank you, someone, Fred. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Fred. Question from Don Bailey. Will a copy of the Zoom recording be available? Yes, it'll be posted. Uh, David Miller is recording it uh, this evening for the Rhinebeck Historical Society and uh, we'll be converting it to a YouTube video, which will be available if you want to go to RhinebeckHistoricalSociety.org, the homepage, uh, just click on videos and you will see this uh, posted there probably within the next uh, three or four days. Uh, another question, uh, you mentioned early in your program about the brick industry down in the Haverstraw layer disappearing sooner than it did further upriver. Um, why was that? I think the last brickyard there closed in 1940 or 42. I, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. And there were a lot of brickyards that did close in that 1920s to 1940s period. Um, Tom did mention that some of the lower Hudson Valley brickyards, their clay deposits were uh, depleted, and a lot of brickyards just simply didn't, Yeah, you know, brick was, um, you know, con not, not considered an essential material um, in you know, the middle of the 20th century for construction, so it was kind of phased out as a building material, and the Hudson River brick sort of had a reputation as not being, um, meeting industry standards as well. The maybe a great and interesting remnant of the Haverstraw brick industry. If anyone's familiar with the, the giant marina at West Haverstraw, which is just kind of like north of the village of Haverstraw, um, there's a sort of, uh, if you look at a, a map, there's a, a kind of an inlet off the river that's now used as a marina. And that was one of the clay pits for the Haverstraw brickyards that um, in this case was close enough to the river that it could be flooded when it was no longer used. Another question about the uniformity of the bricks, obviously from the same brickyard because they were using uh, uniform molds when that particular brickyard, there was a uniform size, but it seems that at least at some point uh, in the 19th century, all of the bricks from the many different brickyards were the same size. 
how did how did that happen? There is a history of the standardization of brick sizes, and there are uh, there's a, a United States standard. The standard size in the UK is a different size. The brick that were used at the Jan van Hosen house that we looked at, that's uh, on Route 66, just north of Hudson, um, that building being from the mid 18th century uses a brick that was made before the current standard was established later in the 19th century. And where there's some patchwork of modern brick used in the walls of that building, you can see the difference in the the size between the current standard and the, the size of bricks that were used then, which were typically a little bit smaller. The brick that I saw being molded in Bangladesh is a different standard um, also. And that's I would guess that's probably the same as the, the UK standard. Um, there are, are different standards. There's Roman brick and other kinds of brick, but um, there is a, a set um, series of dimensions that's considered to be the standard and uh, a long and convoluted history of how that came to be, but it's it's been the standard for uh, for a long, long time. There were uh, there are quite a few more comments about how great your presentation is, how carefully detailed, and I want to echo that. Uh, not only was your talk very detailed, but you had the perfect images to illustrate what you were talking about. And you've obviously done an enormous amount of research over a long period of time and worked together very well. Uh, and even though both of you are very careful to announce at the beginning that you were not the uh, authorities on the history of the brick industry, I could easily be fooled. Uh, so thank you both very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We, we All of our guests. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you, guys. Tom. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming. Thanks a lot. Have a great night. Well, thank you for presenting.